No. Hello, everyone. Yet once again, it's another day of fresh grace and mercy. This is the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast sponsored by Logos Bible Software, where we bridge the gap to Reformed Christian theology for your listening pleasure. Today, we're doing a book club episode. We have Claude Acho on. He's going to be talking about his new book. It's published by Brazos Press, and it's called Reading Black Books, How African-American Literature Can Make Our Faith More Whole and Just. We'll jump into this conversation here in a moment with Peter and myself and Claude. And uh, as a few reminders on the show notes, please click that link to Brazos Press and pick up a copy of this book for yourself or someone you know. And then there's some other links on there as well. There's one to find the closest reformed confessional churches near your area. So you click that link, type in your zip code, and then the closest reformed confessional denominations come up. There's also information about Bridge Builders, uh, you heard me mention uh, uh, Lagos Bible Software. They're our main sponsor. In the halfway through this episode, you'll hear words from some of our other sponsors. But you as an individual could be a bridge builder as well. So you click that link. There's different uh, levels of giving. If you, uh, whatever you're able to do, and if you're not able to give at all, that's okay. This, this show is meant to be free around the world. But like with any growing podcast, Behind the scenes, there's a lot of things that uh, need financial means to use and build our show. So uh, we use anything we can to uh, make sure our show keeps going forward in a good way and uh, faithful to the gospel. Uh, There's uh, other methods of just communicating with Peter and myself. Uh, There's social media. So Twitter and Instagram is what we're on on social media. So at Guilt Grace Pod for both those social media platforms handle. And then our email, of course, everyone's got an email, guiltgracepod at gmail.com. And then uh, YouTube, these these conversations automatically have the uh, video recorded. So go on to YouTube and you can click Guilt Grace Gratitude Podcast, hit subscribe for this type of episode. It's specifically book club. So you can actually go through our playlists and find all the book clubs, including this one or our other uh, playlists uh, series that are out there. So. Without further ado, I'll let Peter further introduce Claude Acho. Yeah, we have Reverend Claude Acho, pastor of Church of the Resurrection in Charlottesville, Virginia, taught African-American literature at the collegiate level and is a regular writer and podcast contributor for Think Christian. He's written for Christ and Pop Culture, Gospel Coalition, and The Witness of Black Christian Collective. It's a pleasure having you on our show, Reverend Acho. Great to be with you guys, man. Thanks for the invite and look forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Heck yeah. So those, those who may not know you, maybe this is their first kind of exposure to you. Maybe they've seen other stuff or, or in Virginia or at your church, who, who knows, but somebody who doesn't know you, let our listeners know maybe a little bit about yourself, your background, uh, and then uh, what you're, what you're doing right now. Yeah, gladly. Um, yeah. So I'm from the Pacific Northwest originally. Uh, so a big fan of the Seattle Supersonics and oh, Seattle Mariners. Uh, and Seahawks. Yeah. 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 I grew yeah, up in that yeah. area too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I grew up there. Um, and uh, yeah, so love, love the Northwest and uh, sort of my, my life's journey has also been connected to New England. I spent a little bit of middle school years over there. Um, and so uh, my wife and I, uh, we've kind of uh, done ministry in a, a bunch of different places. So um, uh, up, up in the Northwest, Bellingham, Washington, and also in Boston, Massachusetts, did some church planning work there. Uh, so, um, served at a church in, in Memphis, Tennessee, wonderful church mm-hmm. for uh, several years. And then now we're uh, doing church planning work in Charlottesville, Virginia, and hoping to uh, plant some deep roots here and, uh, and enjoying, enjoying that journey so far. So that's a little bit of my story, kind of a coastal, coastal person, you know, yeah. West Coast. You're, you're missing uh, one coast, though. You're missing the Southwest. You yeah, the that's north, true. You got the Northwest, you got the, uh, yeah, you got yeah. the Northeast, you got some of the Southeast, you got, you got to make it to SoCal. Yeah, 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 yeah. That would be good. That would be good. I hear, I hear it's pricey, but yeah, good place to visit. Um, oh, yeah. So it's yeah, pricey. That, yeah. <laughs> that's a little, little of my story. Um, and yeah, you know, uh, love, uh, love to read, love to, you know, obviously be with, be with my kids, coach sports, yeah. um, uh, spend time with folks, you know, so pretty basic, pretty basic guy in those respects. But um, yeah, I love these sort of conversations as well. 
Do you think Seattle's going to get the Sonics back someday? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think I think with all the um, you know the pro am Jamal Crawford summer league stuff. I mean, there's such yeah. it's such a basketball city. It's all it, it it's always been such a basketball city, and so yeah. you know it's cool to see the support for the uh, for the Storm, the WNBA team. But um, yeah, it'd be great to add to to return an NBA team there. So oh, I, I think yeah. that'll happen. Oh, Sonics so. has such a rich history there. It was heartbreaking when they what, left. This is way off topic. This is not on the book, yeah, whatever. But was Seattle <laughs> mad when they left? It's oh, like, yeah. Us SoCal people don't know anything. We're just like, oh, yeah, they went to Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. But, like, were they mad? Really mad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it felt a little like a robbery. But, yeah, that's, yeah, we'll we'll keep it. At, we'll keep it at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, you're a Hawks fan, too, right? No, I don't really, fo- I don't oh. really follow the NFL. Um, okay. Yeah, no I don't worries. really follow. Yeah, I followed as a kid. Uh, it's like enjoyed- that's cool. We just can't be friends. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, that's fine. Yeah. No, that's not good. <laughs> I'm a huge. I'll watch King the playoffs. Fan too. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. Okay. That was my my idol growing up. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Cool. Well, <laughs> back on. Yeah, we can yeah. always talk about sports and all that stuff. But back on back on this topic. Um. Well, how how did the idea? And you you talk about this in your introduction a little bit. But how did the idea of this book come about? And we'll ask more questions later on. But why, why this book? And then kind of why write this? Like why write this now? Yeah. So for me, I studied English literature in undergrad and uh, in my grad degree. And I've always loved books. I've always loved stories. And I think what I what I experienced as a um, in my English program. Uh, I experienced really uh, phenomenal instruction, community, and conversation around a lot of different topics because of the the things that we read and really great discussion about texts. Um, and then when we came to certain texts like African American literature, I I felt obviously personally invested in a in a different way, but I also felt like there were really great conversations that were happening, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in our classes and our seminars. But I always felt like I, I wanted an extra conversation, which would have been like, okay, a conversation in the church around mm-hmm. these same things. And obviously that that didn't really exist as part of my program. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't really, you know, I didn't have sort of the um, framework to try to like start those conversations. I just, I just knew it felt like something was missing. It felt like I was getting um, a, a great first course of a meal, but like the sort of next dish was never being served to me. And I didn't know where, where, where to get that. Um, and so later as I developed as a, as a thinker and then as a, and as a pastor, as a Christian, as a writer, mm-hmm. it sort of came together for me, uh, through other examples to take that initiative, uh, upon myself and to say, Hey, let me, let me write something that could bridge those gaps for those who are interested to sort of look at texts, on literary terms, but also on Christian terms, on, on theological terms. And so I think the first seeds of this really came about from the absence of this sort of perspective um, as I was studying these these works. Yeah, kind of, the, kind of before next question, kind of the closest text that came to mind, it's even the title shares the similarities to <clears throat> Esau Macaulay's Reading While Black. It kind of shares like a similar like title flavor. And his is more yeah. like this is how we're reading it through kind of that lens, but you're just actually, oh, let's look at that lens, how they're writing, and then we'll read through that lens as well. Yeah, 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 no doubt. And, um, you know, his work is obviously uh, great, and he's been an inspiration to me and, a, and, a, and an encouragement to me in a lot of different ways. Um, and then the, the other book that was really a, was a, a more explicit direct model for me was Karen Swallow Pryor's On Reading mm-hmm. Well. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah, we had her on um, for that book a little while okay, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your listeners or crew will know. Yeah, so the way she takes a theme uh, per chapter and sort of one one central work, yeah. that that book, I mean, it's, a, it's an excellent book and is a great model. And so reading that, that also True, sort of yeah. catalyzed my thinking to say, yeah, that idea I had, you know, here, here's someone who's really doing that. And mm-hmm. maybe I can contribute with a different genre and yeah. from a different angle. And uh, yeah, I really love that there's just this growing collection of books that can help help the church read read things well. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, now that I think about it, yeah, it's they're very much in a similar vein. Yeah, her yeah, book yeah. on yeah, kind of general like English literature from like the 17th to like the 20th century, and yours on black literature from the 20th century. That's yes. I, yeah, I didn't see that link until you pointed out. I was like, oh yeah, duh, that's that link is there. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So she was she's a great great model inspiration for me. Yeah, awesome. Very nice. Yeah, and the the structure of your book, uh, you provide a theological approach to ten seminal texts of the 20th century. African American literature. So the question is, why focus in the 20th century specifically? 
Yeah. So uh, on a pragmatic level, I focused there because those were the texts that I knew the best. Uh, mm -hmm. But then on a more philosophical level, I wanted to do texts as well that had stood the test of time a little bit, but also were close enough that they could still they could still um, very explicitly speak to some yeah. of the so same people issues. People might think of like with. Frederick Douglass's speeches in like the 1800s and like, oh, why wasn't that put in the text too? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I, and I, and I did get him a little bit in the introduction, but yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to do things that were, um, that, that have sort of been deemed canonical because I think that matters. And then also things that were near enough that we could more readily see the connective tissue to things that we're talking about and struggling with or confused about, uh, today. So they're just like, they're closer to us. So they, we struggle quote unquote with the same stuff that they struggle yeah. with. Yeah, yeah, they're both they're they're both canonical and they're still close. And so so I really appreciated that. But yeah, I mean, to to be straight up, like the first thing was like, I, I have to do a text that I that I kind of know. And these are the, these are the yeah. ones that I know know the best for, mm -hmm. for what that's worth. So I, I decided to to go there. Awesome. Yeah. And just kind of attached to that question too. who who are these authors? I think it's appropriate and respectful to introduce them to the audience, say their names and, and uh, let them let the audience know who they are, what are these texts by who and and why these authors and texts. Yeah, yeah. So most most of the books that I cover are novels. There's a, a, a two chapters that are um, based more in poetry. Uh, so I cover Ralph Ellison's uh, Invisible Man, uh, yep. which was, uh, you know, one of the best novels of the 20th century came mm -hmm. out in 1952. Uh, James Baldwin's debut, uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain, mm -hmm. uh, Richard two Richard Wright novels, uh, Native Son and The Man Who Lived Underground, which uh, originally was a short story. And then uh, just last year, 2021, they published a sort of fuller right. version of that as they discovered the, the true notes that he, he that he had had for The Man Who Lived Underground. So I was really, uh, really pleased to be able to have that, for that discovery to happen in time to include in this book. So it's a powerful story, pairs well with The Invisible Man as well. Uh, Toni Morrison's Beloved, uh, Nella Larson's Passing, which Netflix recently adapted into a movie, huh. a kind of a key Harlem Renaissance text. Zora Neale Hurston's Moses Man of the Mountain is sort of her remix of the Exodus story. She was the daughter of a right. preach, yep. uh, preacher, and uh, she remixes the Exodus narrative in a real zany way, but it's really clear that she knew, uh, she, she really knew the scriptures she really, <laughs> to, to make the changes that she made. She was yeah. a pretty, pretty studious. Um, so th those texts, uh, let me see, um, and then poetry from uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, The Litany of Atlanta, poetry mm -hmm. from County Cullen, the Black Christ and Christ Recrucified in the South. Um, let me see if I'm thinking, uh, if I'm missing a, I think an author. A, I'm trying I think to I think, got everyone. I don't have the book in front of me, but I'm I'm trying to think of the table of contents. And I think I think that's right. I could be wrong. Margaret Walker's For My People. That's the that's other right. poem. Yeah. 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 So so those are the pieces. So so seven, seven novels and then three pieces of poetry. And and then, and, I, and, I, and then and as to why I picked those, so yeah. uh, I think some of those will be familiar to, to folks listening as sort of kind of landmark texts. Maybe, you know, Native Son, you may have read in high school, Invisible Man, you may have read selections in high school. Uh, Toni Morrison, obviously one of the best, uh, you know, authors, um, American authors that we've had. So I, I wanted to certainly pick landmark people, but then I wanted to, out of their catalog, try to pick particular texts that I think uh, raised important questions uh, or challenging questions or had sort of interesting resonances with with the, with our faith as Christians. Uh, and so I sort of, once I knew Toni Morrison, I wanted to have her work. That was a given. Then it was sort of, okay, I think this text really contributes to the conversation. Um, Baldwin has a lot of stuff that he's written. Uh, and then this one is really a novel set in the church as he tries to grapple with the faith that he grew up around. So that was sort of a no-brainer. So once I sort of settled authors, I, I tried to look at text that I felt like spoke a, uh, an important thematic word to, to, to us today and to uh, explore and investigate those. Yeah. Um, and maybe this is, this is not one that we, we sent, um, but why, and this is, <clears throat> this could be not necessarily a hard question, but some of these authors just aren't well known, I guess today. Um, and, and maybe, and we have like other texts that we have from the 20th century. We have like F Scott Fitzgerald. We have like, Kind of in that stream that people know why why, why aren't these <clears throat> authors as well known as maybe they should be or um because for me re reading your book i was like oh I've, i haven't heard of this person i haven't heard of this this mm -hmm. essay or this novel um why do you think they kind of fell out of favor yeah i think it's really just a perspective thing i think you know depending on and and that's why i, I was excited to write this book uh for for 
yeah, for all audiences, but for the church especially was, I, I think you can, you can, it just depends. There, there's no uh, sort of consistency of what you might get, you know, yeah. as you go through school. So these names, you know, are, are really well known in some circles, but then in other places they're, they're not. And so it just kind of, you just don't know what you're going to get in some ways. I think, you know, people sort of know Tony Morrison, they know James Baldwin, he's had a resurgence mm-hmm. over the last few years, but in terms of sort of being guided to encounter their work, um, it, it, it's sort of, it's kind of hit or miss, you know, I, I feel like, uh, you, you know, some of the other names you, you mentioned, like uh, Fitzgerald and Great Gatsby, those are things that have been real clear staples um, that I think feel broadly consistent. But these are really important part of our stories, too. You know, uh, so so I would say one perspective. Um, yeah, it just it, it can be hit or miss. And I think in other situations, the subject matter is hard, right? It's, it's difficult to read these things to talk yeah. about, uh, talk about race, talk about uh, um, our the, the hard, uh, hard and tragic parts of our history as Americans. And so, you know, I think in some cases, not all cases, you know, sometimes it's just easier to not do that. Yeah. Um, but but I think more broadly, it, it's just not consistent what people are going to get through their English, you know, through eight, middle school English, high school English. Uh, so it kind of depends for some people that really know them. And then for others, it's like, man, I've never heard of any of these folks. Yeah. And that's a big reason why I wanted to put this book out there. Yeah, yeah. And like, yeah, reintroduce them for those who may have read them before, or for somebody like me who has read them to introduce them to me for the first time and, and those who are reading this book for the first time. And like you said, I think in your introduction, you said something like read these books first and then come back to this. Like, how would you, how would you read these books in tandem with the book that you read? Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I definitely, you know, there's, you know, those, those sort of uh, extra uh, extra credit folks who, uh, who <laughs> want to go above and beyond. Yeah. Like, I, I think if you're willing to do that, I, I think you will, it will be a really uh, powerful experience for you to sometimes read. what you say it's like man i wish they said harder but i didn't read the book i don't know like yeah. the context this is coming in yeah yeah so I, w- I wouldn't say people have to do that by any means that would be a, a really lopsided book to be like you have to read these books before you yeah. read mine but i think the best way to read my book is to do it communally which would be to read uh to read my book with others and then pick a few of these novels and read with that same group of people because uh, you know the way stories work different things hit us in particular ways and based on our background based on our our sort of perspective and all of that and we we need each other to process these sort of things so ideally you know you people read native son together then they read my chapter then they meet and talk and um and i think that's a much uh healthier way to explore these big ideas in a process and to learn and grow together um I mean, I wrote it in a way that people could just read my book. And then as they read my book, they could later decide, oh, I, I want to dip into this or I want to dip into that. So it works in in, in any way. But um, my, my hope is that it would be a, a kind of a communal project for people to take up together. Hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. That's a, yeah, a helpful way of yeah, kind of structuring this. Um, and so a, a chapter that particularly struck me, this is towards-ish the end of the book, was um, du Bois's The Litany of Atlanta. And he structured, he structured his liturgy um, of sorts, like you talk about, around the Psalms, and particularly the Psalms of Lament. Uh, and coming from somebody who who tries, so I, I write I write the liturgy for the church that I'm mm-hmm. planting in Santa Ana. Um, and we didn't have a Psalm of Laments. And then I read, I read the chapter in the book. And then that week we started with the Psalm of Laments um, mm-hmm. right after reading the law. Because it's like, this is, I think this is a really crucial part of the Psalter that we're missing. And Du Bois really makes a big point of that. Um, so how have these books kind of, so this in particular for me, but how have these books and authors in their lives shape the way that you read, that you write, that you worship, and that you think about God? Yeah, so I, I can relate to, to what you're sharing there. Um, as I was working on that chapter uh, in particular, I, it just helped me realize what you mentioned, just how often the sort of expressing of grief is absent from okay from our, our worship in church. And I think you're right. And as I try to mention in the chapter, it's like uh, so much of that is connected to our usage of, of the Psalter and the Psalms. Mm-hmm. So if we're using the Psalms, then this will happen. Yeah, <laughs> like, we have quite, language quite, for laments. And if yeah, not, yeah. like, w- like when something yeah. like you talk about, something happens around us and says, like, we don't yes. have the language to That's right. like talk about this. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it really brought that lesson home in a deep way for me. And, you know, the, this is not a, this is obviously not my insight. This is, this is something yeah. the church has thought about for a long time. Uh, and, and so, so it, it sort of confirmed, uh, confirmed that for me and, and brought that home in a new way. Um, and I, and I, and I do think that's probably the biggest takeaway that could sort of thread through all of the works is because there is this sort of, I think a thread through all of these novels and poems is just a sort of, um, this is a deep honesty um, and, and, and a vocalization of that honesty through story. Um, and depending on the author, different sort of scales of hope that, that are connected to that honesty. So for some of these authors, less hope, and for some of them, much more. But I think for me, the, the, the big practice was just sort of um, the need for the sort of deep honesty. And I, I think that that really does loop into, you know, what you're speaking of with Lament and sort of how we can uh, form and shape uh, uh, our life together as the church to, um, to be hopeful, but also to be honest and to recognize that honesty and hope actually have to work together. Um, you know, we, we, be, we, we recognize the need for, for deep hope in Christ, um, and in his kingdom only insofar as we're really honest about the way things are not good, the, the way things are difficult personally, the way things are difficult societally, uh, the way things maybe are difficult in our local community. And so the sort of connection between honesty and hope uh, really stood out to me as I thought through these works. Um, and instead of seeing them as opposed, you actually see them as integrated and necessary. Yeah. yeah. And to kind of dig into that, was there, because you, you, you know these works, you've read these works, you're kind of diving into them. But as you were writing, was there a particular work that you've read before, but kind of hit you anew? Like, man, this this is either prescient for the time right now that I'm in, or I didn't I didn't see this aspect of this book before. Now that I'm writing about it, was there a book or kind of a work or a chapter that you wrote? Like, man, this this is hitting hard right now. I think uh, Baldwin's "Go Tell It on the Mountain," which is sort of his semi uh, autobiographical novel about his experience growing up in the Holiness Pentecostal Church. Um, and with uh, his uh, his stepdad, who was a a preacher in the church, but was uh, you know very uh, very cold, uh, abusive, hypocritical, um, you know. And so, reading that again this time around, in light of um, I'm thinking of you know podcasts like the Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, all of these different sort of things, I, I, I was reading the book with that additional lens and reference point. And as I read that, I realized like, wow, this, um, this really speaks to this, this could be a text for ministers. This could be a, a pastoral ministry seminary course, you know, sort of like a, a, an additional text where you need to write and reflect and discuss together. And so I, I had not really considered that lens the first time that I had encountered that novel. And that really struck me this time around. I wasn't, I, I didn't want to explicitly, um, talk about, you know, pastoral scandals or something like that in my book, because I didn't want it to be dated by, yeah. by particular events. But, uh, but I think it, as you, as folks read, I think they can sort of see that subtext when, when I speak about um, sort of how our conception of God manifests in, in the way we, we love and we, we lead and we treat others. Uh, and so, so I think that novel is sort of like a word to to pastors and clergy really stood out to me th this time around. So I, I would I would particularly commend that to to folks listening who are in um, vocational pastoral ministry or aspiring to that. I, I think it's um it's a text that you could look at in that way uh, as well, and I think it'd be fruitful. Hmm. And then maybe so not for you personally, I guess, but as you're as you're writing this, is there a particular chapter or a particular book that you think will, so for us coming from, you can call it outside in, who, like we don't have the experience that you have. We don't have experience that a lot of these texts will have um, as writing it or during the civil rights era, like what, whatever it is, is there a, a, a helpful text as you research, as you read, as you wrote, that you think you think could be helpful for, you, you can say us coming from the outside in trying to like say, like what, 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 what are they experiencing? How are they how are they writing? How are they worshiping? Um, we can like, we, we can't live that life, but like we can see that life. We can kind of experience. Is there is there a particular test you think that's helpful for that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, you know, I would I would encourage people to you know as they look at the list of these novels, I think uh, as they kind of look through the overview of them, I think they could sort of see and say, oh, th this this sounds really uh, different than you know maybe what I what I. I've heard or what I've uh, 
conversations I've had or, or whatever. And so I think people can sort of self-select. Um, I am prone to suggest uh, Invisible Man um, mm -hmm. just because it, it's so focused on uh, relationality and how how the protagonist is seen. But then also the, the novel is also interested in how the protagonist sees others. So the sort of uh, mutuality of how we relate to people and how we relate as image bearers. So I, I'm prone to suggest that novel because it sort of follows his this long winding journey from the south to the north of this protagonist who wants to be seen, wants to uh, be dignified and struggles to find that in this kind of Jim, Jim Crow era in which he lives. And I think it raises important questions about how we see the world, how we see ourselves, how we see others. Mm. Um, and so, so, so that, that might be my first recommendation, but I would, I would encourage people to kind of yeah. um, self-assess and maybe, and, and again, I think it's always really good to follow within a framework to follow the interests that, that somebody has. So if you, you, you look and you're like, man, I, I, I like this in chapter eight, like go, go straight there, you know, read mm -hmm. the intro, jump right in, you know, you, you know, you know, you know where you're being pulled for a reason and then, and then go for that. Those, those are good ways to engage. Mm. So it's like maybe to add on to so the book is not so much like a you can call it like building off an argument so you have to read chapter one to read chapter eight they're, they're kind of like self-contained chapters where you can kind of dip into one then dip into another yeah i think you really can yeah i would encourage people to um yeah to to read the intro and then kind of go go nuts from there you know um i mean the <laughs> yeah. book, make the book work for you it's your book you know so yeah. um i i did i did write it where it builds um yeah. But, but, and so there's, there, there'll be some references that, that people might not catch. Gotcha. Um, but, but I think at large, you know, uh, read the introduction and then kind of go from there. Um, a, a friend did suggest to me that the first kind of like, it kind of works like the two tables of the 10 commandments is sort of like toward God <laughs> and then toward others. Yeah. I was like, that, that, like, that's great. That's nice. I, that was not a plan. <laughs> yeah. That was, that's just, that, if that's there, that's maybe just what happened, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I would encourage people to, to, to read as they see fit. And, and again, if possible to do it with others. Awesome. Yeah. And as far as one of our last questions and, and by all means, after this question, if, if you feel like there's anything else to bring to the table, please do. Um, but as we conclude, what is your hope for racial justice in the church and how is it explained? How is this explained with hope theologically? Mm. Yeah, you know, maybe for this, um, I would encourage, uh, or I, I could gesture towards the last, the last chapter of the book, which is, um, which I, I, I discuss Margaret Walker's poem for my people, uh, through the lens of hope. I think it's a poem that sort of, uh, recapitulates a lot of the themes that are earlier in the book, uh, which is why I wanted to end that way. Mm. Uh, so there is some, there is some order and coherence to the chapters. Um, yep. But that, that poem, uh, it has this level of deep honesty. Um, and then it ends with the sort of hope that, that I think actually when you sort of read it in a very natural sort of naturalistic kind of rational way, it's like this actually doesn't make a lot of sense. Like, yeah. like how can, how can you have laid out all of these different things that then now you're, you're saying, let a new world arise, let this happen. Let the, you know, it's sort of like uh, these things don't seem to add up. Um, and I, I think that's sort of um, the, I think that's very Christian, you know, the sort of uh, if we look in terms of human power, human wisdom, human strategy, uh we're not going to be in a lot of situations where we're actually going to be hopeful because th those things will not get us or get us where we need to go or achieve what we need to see transformed and happened. It, it has to be a power that comes from outside of us. It has to be um, God himself that, that brings the transformation that we need um, both for salvation, but also to sustain and, and to keep the church and to uh, help us be uh, unified um, and righteous and holy um, as a, uh, as one new people in, in Christ. So uh, to me, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's always where, uh, where hope rests and in the power, uh, in the power of Christ by his spirit to, to achieve, um, to achieve what he desires for his church and for his world. So I always have hope because of that, because Jesus is alive and risen. Um, and so, so I always have hope there. Um, I, I think what I would hope for this book to do in terms of racial justice is, the recognition that we're not the first people to think about these things and for us to recognize that if we seem to be at a dead end with some of these conversations and some of these ideas and some of this action maybe we'll be helped by looking back and not just resting on our own sort of new insights about things mm -hmm. that we can look back and we can learn from mistakes that have been made we can learn back look back and look at authors who had hope in really 
dire conditions yeah. that um yeah. that in ways are um they're right in the thick of it and they're writing this yeah much much uh much more uh brutal with a sort of immediacy than what we stand in now and uh we can learn from them and i think if we do that together as a church prayerfully um and and humbly um the lord is with us and the, the lord will be at, be at work i mean i think we have uh through the spirit through the gospel through the scriptures we have all that we need uh to to see god bring redemption um in in his body um but it takes work <laughs> and and uh so so i have those sort of that that sort of honest perspective and that sort of hopeful perspective and again the reason i i emphasize so much the need to do this communally is because i, I think a book like this um is not the sort of thing that's going to do um powerful work at some really large level i think it's going to do work in the level of of one church, you know, of, of one small group of, you know, one uh, group of, of, of friends that like to read theological stuff. I think that's where change happens in, in local particular ways. And that's also where I hold out hope for as well. So I, I try not to think too broadly about uh, racial justice and conversations in, in the church at large, because it's so broad that I can't, I can't grab hold of that but I can know what's happening in my church. I can know what's happening in my own neighborhood. And I think that's where this book can, can bring, um, bring one element of, um, of change and of help is what actually happens with real people uh, in, a, in a real setting, in a real neighborhood. And God can be at work through that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And maybe, and I forgot to ask this kind of towards the beginning of this, but you, you do end the book, like you said, with hope. This is kind of a, a good way of ending it but is, is there like a certain way that you wrote this book like why why put one book at the beginning one book in the middle one book at the end um yeah hope. so was there like a kind of a a system for that yeah yeah there was I, I think um i had really i had conceived of the book initially as really following like a systematic theology sort of yeah. outline okay. that's what i and figured I, yeah 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 um and obviously as as you guys know there's there's a lot of different approaches to that but i was sort of following more a modern so like kind of start with the image of god and then kind of move mm -hmm. move that way um and then as i as i started writing i realized i didn't want to make the book i, I realized i was going to struggle between giving proper attention to the literary text and then to like theological ideas so i i tried to move uh, make it a little bit um not less theological but but sort of less of like, Hey, this is going to be like a theological survey. Um, it, but I, but I kept that same structure. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I wanted to sort of start with those sort of foundational things of like kind of a hum humanity and, and then, um, uh, God himself mm -hmm. and then brokenness and then sort of the, the different relational pieces that come out of that. But, I, but I knew I wanted to end, end with hope. Um, especially because of the way I conceive of hope is not being opposed to saying things are horrible. We have a problem things are hard right yeah. but that that actually is a part of hope and i think that's the sort <laughs> yeah. of hopefully a last word yeah. that can yeah. you know send send people send people out and um and i think the hope chapter also allowed me to try to turn on my preacher voice and, and do some of that too mm -hmm. which which definitely happens throughout the book and i'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm glad yeah. to i'm glad to have those moments as well yeah it's like what we talk about kind of the reform tradition is you, you can't really have a gospel w without the law you can't really have the the good news the hope without yeah. knowing just how bad stuff are in, yes. in reality, where I think too often, at least kind of in our context, it tends to be, it tends to be, and I'm, I'm, I won't make a huge general statement, but it tends to be kind of like white conservative churches. It's like, it's just hope, or it's just mm. like the good news or just like happy thoughts and like all the, all the, like this, this world is not our home. This is like, this world still has injustice. This world still has stuff that's just not right yet. And you tend not to focus on that. You tend to focus on the end game where everything else gets filtered through that end game versus what I think is really helpful from this approach is you get to really truly dwell in this because yeah. of how much better the end game is. Yeah. 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 These books will not, um, yeah, these books will not let you get to hope tritely, right? You, yeah. you can't, you can't take an easy jump to that. <laughs> then hope which gets is, even better after you get like through yeah. the, the trenches. Yeah. It, it means something and it's something that we can access now and, um, and be, um, yeah, be, be, uh, empowered now. Right. Uh, and, and I think that's the other thing with these texts too, is I would just encourage people as they, as they read to think through like the particular lens, like this is about 
African American experience. But it's also, I think these authors are uh, stood the test of time because they understand how African American experience is a particular experience inside of human experience. Mm. Uh, and so while it may not be your experience, um, you're connected to these people because yeah. <laughs> you're humans, we're, yeah. we're in God's image. Yep. And I think these, these authors do, uh, they have a way of doing both of those things mm -hmm. without losing the particularity and without um, making important sharp points mm -hmm. that are, are hard to hear, but are really necessary because they're truthful. Yeah. Uh, so, so I really, uh, yeah, just have a great respect for, for these authors, even from all their different backgrounds. I think they, as a whole, really understand that. And I think that's part of great literature. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Yeah. So as, as we conclude, if, the, if there's anything we didn't cover, something you want like our listeners to know, like what, what are you hoping to do with this book? People, I mean, authors write their books for a reason. So it's, is there particularly hope, particular hope you have for this book? I know you talked about local communities and kind of change the local level. Um, but as we conclude, any parting thoughts, anything that you, you'd love for people to know about this work? Yeah, you know, I, I, I was really hoping this would be a book that would, uh, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, for those who are, you know, religiously open, that, that may want to read these things because they like these texts, that they might be open to some Christian reflection and literary reflection on them. I, I wanted to serve those people. But ultimately, you know, I wanted to write this book for, for the church, for Christians, as a guide into these texts, uh, as a deep, deeper guide for those that know them, and as an introduction and guide for those that are, that are not familiar. I think there's, um, you know, I started working on this March 2020. Um, so I'm, I mean, in June 2020, I'm thinking about the Invisible Man chapter. So that's uh, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, all of these killings and things that are happening. So I'm, I'm writing, thinking about these things um, with, with you know, different emotions in my heart. And then also sort of like, man, I'm seeing, oh, well, what do we read? What do we think about? How do, how do, you know, how do, we, how do we learn about these things? How do we have these conversations? And again, as I mentioned previously, it just felt like, there are many ways to do that. I think one way is to look at this literature and to look at it through a literary lens and through a, a theological lens. And I think that's a, that's a gift um, that we can become, uh, um, that we can grow from, you know? So I, I really wanted to write something that would really be intellectually stimulating, but then spiritually edifying. Uh, and then I think out of those two would, would grow us in our discipleship and our practice. So, so I'm hoping that's, that's my hope. My hope is that it serves the church and, and that it's a blessing in that way. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah. It's um, yeah. I think it's helpful. We, like you said, at the beginning of this, it's, this is not a new conversation. I think so often it's, it's approached like a new conversation and know that these conversations have been going on for a long time with, with authors um, who've gone through experiences that we haven't gone through or, or deeper experiences. And we can enter into that stuff with this conversation with their works and then have that conversation continue on even today. Um, same questions are being asked, same stuff's being asked. Um, yeah, is there any hope in this world? Like, what, what, like, where do we go mm -hmm. for when, when stuff is just not going right here? It's injustice, but like, we know justice is going to be done at some point. Uh, it's to be brought perfectly at the end, but it's, it's a really helpful guide, I think, for those who are listening. Um, on, yeah, how do we think about these works and, um, how do we use these works in our conversations and our, our own reflections and, um, a perspective different than ours? It's, this is, um, mm -hmm. we can, we could really, we're really helped, um, from reading people, you, you may agree, you may disagree with whatever it is, but at least their perspective is different and you can, you can learn from a different perspective, um, which is sorely needed in, I think, yeah. in today's context where a, another perspective tends to be bad. It's if they're not my mm. perspective, then I'm not really going to read that perspective. Mm. Um, but Claude, thank you so much for, for writing this, for um, coming on and, and talking about this important works and either introducing it to people who haven't heard of them for the first time or reintroducing those like i remember this mm -hmm. from school i remember people talking mm -hmm. about this and um having the desire to pick it up and and read and uh learn more about their faith and about kind of the heritage and, and all that stuff so thanks for writing this and thanks for coming on yeah, yeah my pleasure appreciate y'all thank you, you too. yeah thank you